Okay, so totally independent of it being President's Day recently, I went on a US President's kick. Uh, it actually started with me just seeing the, the Matt and Shane's secret podcast that discussed all the presidents with Louis C.K. And honestly, Louis' thoughts on the presidents of his lifetime was really interesting, and it was cool to see that these guys definitely read a lot and had a lot of cool things to say about the various presidents. Then the obligatory best or worst presidents lists came out on YouTube, and I started listening to a book on Jefferson and Adams by Gordon Wood, and I was already reading another Gordon Wood book, and everything just sort of came together. Anyways, I honestly didn't feel like I was qualified enough or could work fast enough to make a top 10 or bottom 10 presidents list video. That being said, in this process I was able to re-memorize all the presidents, and in this process I realized something. There's a lot of presidents that everyone just totally forgets about. And as it turns out, there are polls on this and we can see what the least well-known presidents actually are. So today we're going to be looking at the least well-known presidents in US history, why they're not well-known, and what these presidents actually did. So remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that fun stuff. Subscribe and follow me on Instagram and X. First I want to look at a chart of the presidents. YouGov has a fame metric for all the presidents, and they have rankings on how well known each of them are. I've put them in chronological order and charted it with the y-axis starting at 50% just since every president has a majority familiarity. Quickly, we can see that popularity isn't just random. The founding presidents are very well known, but then fame tanks after Jackson in 1837. We see a spike with Polk, but it stays low until Lincoln in 1861, at which point it shoots up again. The Lincoln spike sort of peters out by either Hayes and then kind of up again with Garfield in 1776 and 1881, and then stays relatively low until Teddy Roosevelt in 1901. The Teddy spike stays up until the end of Wilson in 1920, and then it dips down and then comes back up with Hoover in 1928. From there, recency bias takes over and every post-war president is pretty well known. In short, we really have three presidential dark ages in terms of how popular they are. Running from 1837 to 60, 1876 to 1901, and 1920 to 28, with each dip getting smaller. If we look at the presidents, this time focusing on the men themselves, we can quickly see who the most popular are just by looking at them. Most of these guys are pretty recognizable. Then there's sort of like a middling tier, ranging from reasonably well-known people like Ford to someone who a passing US history buff might know a bit about. But after all these guys are presidents that are kind of hard to remember, they usually get lost in the presidential lists. And even if you do remember them, you probably don't know much about their presidencies at all. I personally picked out the presidents here that I think are the least remembered, and according to this YouGov poll, I was pretty darn close to what they came out with as well. In chronological order, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, Rutherford B. Hayes, Chester A. Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, and Warren G. Harding. When compared to the YouGov poll, only a couple differences exist. YouGov includes McKinley in the bottom 10, who I think is a bit more popular just because he's one of the four presidents who have been assassinated. I also have Hayes, while they don't have Hayes in their bottom 10, but honestly, tell me something about Hayes besides the Compromise of 1877. That's right, you can't, and I bet a lot of you don't even know what that is. YouGov ranks Buchanan, Polk, and Cleveland below Hayes, but to those I say uh, Buchanan starts the secession crisis, uh, Polk is the Mexican-American War, and Cleveland is the only two non-sequential term president, uh, and those are their claims to fame, which I think are bigger than Hayes's. I also personally uh, feel that the most forgotten president is Chester A. Arthur. He looks very similar to Cleveland and he comes right before him and he has kind of like a first name for a last name. 
YouGov says it's Pierce, which I think is also a fair choice since his name isn't as like generic presidential sounding as Arthur. Uh, but let me know in the comments who you think the least popular president is. So now that we know these guys in these eras were the forgotten presidents, let's examine why these eras were such ghost towns, what happened during them, and what the presidents did to contribute to that. The first and worst period from 1837 to 60 comes after the Founding Fathers and their protégés, but before Lincoln and the Civil War. Through this period, which I call the Growing Pains period, the main things going on are westward expansion and slavery. As Jackson left office, Texas had won independence and was hoping to join the U.S., while Indian nations in the southeast were being forcibly moved to Oklahoma. American states stretched as far west as Missouri, and territorial holdings spanning to the Pacific Northwest, with some areas contested with England. Mexico controlled the entire southern and western areas except for Texas. At the same time, southern states defended slavery not just in their own states, but at the federal level, and free states in the north did the same. Westward expansion perpetually complicated this, as when new states were added, there were attempts to keep the number of slave and free states even in the Senate and at the federal level to ensure that no one side got enough power at the federal level to dismantle the other. This interplay was the fundamental tension in the U.S. until the Civil War, and every president through this Growing Pains era had to deal with it. Growing pains also came in the form of population, with America's first big wave of immigration. Starting in the 40s, but somewhat peaking in the 50s, over 5 million immigrants came to the US, overwhelmingly from Ireland and Germany, due largely to the potato famine, economic downturn, and political instability. This period also spans the second party system, with the two main parties being the Democrats and the Whigs. The Whigs were generally more conservative, and had a base of wealthier people, and they opposed expanding the country and had a more protectionist stance on economics. The Democrats, by contrast, were more populist while also simultaneously increasing the power of the executive, which Andrew Jackson did, and they supported expansionism. It also was stronger on states' rights and slavery, while the Whig Party wasn't very diehard on the subject at all. It's also worth noting that for most of American history, Political parties were big tents, in the sense that there was lots of diversity in viewpoints within one party, unlike today, where the parties have very rigid ideas. The first president we'll look at here was Martin Van Buren, a Northern Democrat who had been Jackson's Secretary of State. The start of his administration was colored by what Jackson had set in motion. The Trail of Tears mostly happened under Martin Van Buren, who had the power to stop it but didn't enforce migration of the five civilized nations west, resulting in the deaths of as many as 16,000 people. Additionally, the Panic of 1837 set in, a major economic downturn that had been the worst dip in the U.S. to that point. Van Buren tried to continue Jackson's economic policies, which may have started the issue in the first place, uh, including not refounding the American bank, which arguably only made the issue worse. Van Buren was also involved in the Amistad case and supported the return of the people on the ship to Spain as slaves. However, he also opposed the annexation of Texas, fearing tensions with Mexico, and he would later join the Free Soiler Party, which opposed the expansion of slavery into new American states. Van Buren only served one term and lost the 1840 election to William Henry Harrison, a former General Whig from Indiana. Harrison ran on a platform of largely ignoring the slavery issue and promised to reinstate the American bank to help regulate economic issues. However, he never got the chance to do any of this as just 31 days into his presidency, he died. While it is commonly believed that he got pneumonia from giving a long inauguration address in the rain without a coat, it is more likely that he died of enteric fever from contaminated water, given that he didn't have any symptoms for weeks and DC was built on a swamp. As we'll see later, a couple other presidential deaths may be attributable to the DC water supply. Harrison was the first president to die in office, and he was succeeded by his vice president in 1841, John Tyler. This was arguably Tyler's greatest contribution to American history, 
as the Constitution was rather ambiguous to succession protocols and that wouldn't be ironed out to the 1960s. While it said that the VP would take up the president's duties, it wasn't clear if the VP actually became president or if he was just an interim until a special election. Tyler remained as president and finished out Harrison's term, and arguably got more done than Van Buren. Tyler also opposed the US bank, unlike Harrison, and he was almost impeached after vetoing it. However, he also economically encouraged Western expansion with the Log Cabin Bill, enabling settlers to claim land before it officially went up for sale and giving it to them at a cheap price. He also oversaw the 1842 Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which settled the Canadian border in Maine and Wisconsin Territory, now part of Minnesota. In 1845, Tyler formally annexed Texas into the US, increasing tensions with Mexico. If you remember what we said about the Whigs earlier, it will come as no surprise that Tyler broke from his party during his presidency over the expansionism issue and the bank, and as such, he had no ticket to run on for the next election. He would later become a Democrat and even be nominated to the Confederate Congress in the Civil War and die in 1862. But in 1844, the election went to James K. Polk, a Democrat who is more well known and is the lone prominent president in this era, so we won't talk much about him. Polk only served one term and promised to not run again, one of the few presidents to do so, although he would die shortly after his term, again, likely from disease from DC's drinking water. Polk managed to split Oregon territory between the US and Canada, finalizing the Northern American border and annexing the whole American Southwest from Mexico. One of the generals from this war, Zachary Taylor, a Southern Whig, won the 1848 election after Van Buren came back as a free soiler third party and split the Democratic vote. Since Taylor was a Southern slave owner, he was relatively popular with both parties, but this quickly changed. While Taylor supported the Compromise of 1850, which would happen after his presidency, he also supported new states writing their own constitutions and deciding on slavery for themselves. As it turned out, most of the coming candidates would have been free states, and some Southerners threatened it with a succession convention since this would upset the balance. Taylor threatened them right back, saying that if southern states seceded, he would lead the army down himself and hang the perpetrators. Taylor was one of the few presidents at this time that took a stronger stance on the slavery issue, but we don't know how things would have turned out, because he too died in office in 1850, also likely from gastrointestinal disease from the DC drinking water. Once again, a vice president became president, Millard Fillmore, also a Whig, the last Whig president and the last president that wasn't part of the Democratic or Republican parties, Fillmore took more significant steps on the slavery issue, although these steps were more in the vein of compromise. Namely, the Compromise of 1850, which strengthened the Fugitive Slave Law, making federal entities responsible for returning runaway slaves in free states to the South. It also brought in California as a free state and ended the slave trade in DC, as well as giving Texas's debt to the federal government and granting popular sovereignty to former Mexican territories. In 1852, Fillmore oversaw the Gadsden Purchase from Mexico, which finalized the borders in the contiguous US. Notably, Fillmore opposed further imperialism and shot down propositions to annex Hawaii. While he was later nominated by the anti-immigrant Know Nothing Party, Fillmore appears to not have been very interested in them. Another one-term president that didn't run again, spoiler alert, all of these presidents are one-term presidents, Fillmore's presidency was succeeded by that of Northern Democrat Franklin Pierce in 1853. Up to this point, the presidents we've looked at have been mostly like, eh, but Pierce was actually pretty bad. Before his inauguration, Pierce's son was killed in front of him in a train crash, and for his entire presidency, he was deeply depressed and drunk. While Pierce was sympathetic to the South and likely wouldn't have helped the slavery issue anyway, his condition only made things worse in a very tense and pivotal time in US history. While he did some things to reduce corruption, Pierce's main legacy was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act. Another attempt to remedy the slavery expansion issue, the act repealed the decades-old Missouri Compromise, 
which prevented southern states from being free and northern states from having slaves. At the same time, two new territories, Kansas and Nebraska, were created, and these territories were allowed to vote for themselves if slavery would be legal there or not. In Kansas specifically, this led to a flood of settlers and militants into the state from the north and south, trying to push those of the other persuasion out. Violence broke out in addition to a series of corrupt governments, and the state became a microcosm for the Civil War. Then Buchanan ends out this one, but he's not one of the nine I'm going to talk about today, and then the Civil War saga takes place, and most of the presidents here are more well-known. But in 1876, our next slump starts and runs until 1901, a grouping that we can call the Gilded Age Presidents. While slavery was over, so was Reconstruction, which we'll get into in a second. Western expansion also continues, not only in the form of imperialism, but also the Indian Wars, which thoroughly settled the West and put most all natives onto reservations despite previous treaties. Immigration was shooting up as well. The first wave of immigration to the US was continuing until the 80s, and then a second massive wave started around the turn of the century. Like the 1850s, the 1880s spike of the first wave was primarily Germans and Irish, with almost 10 million people arriving. The second, much larger wave primarily was composed of Southern and Eastern Europeans, namely Italians, Russians, and Austro-Hungarians, although it's worth noting that Poles would be counted between these latter two, given the lack of a Polish state at this time. Altogether, another 18 million immigrants arrived in the U.S. in this second wave. It was during this wave that Ellis Island in New York was created for processing incoming European immigrants. But the biggest development of this time, which united all the other factors, was the Industrial Revolution. Starting in the 1870s, the creation of factories and railroads paved the way for urbanization, mass production, and cross-country trade and development. A large, cheap workforce was needed to work in these large industrial centers, hence the need for immigration, while secure land in the West was needed for railroads and the development of population centers across the country, hence the Indian Wars. Through this expansion, a handful of men got increasingly rich, setting the stage for modern income inequality, as well as heightened tensions between the working class and the barons they worked for. Divides in this era weren't over slavery, but over labor, with progressives supporting labor unions and better conditions and rights for workers, and corporate sympathizers favoring the higher-ups, who held the massive sway in the economy and were key to the country's development. The Gilded Age had the same parties that we have today, Democrats and Republicans, and again, as we said before, these were big tent parties, so many people on different sides of issues could be in the same party. Republicans tended to have a base more in the middle class, as well as the black freedmen in the South, although their vote was largely suppressed by Jim Crow laws passed by Democrats and the Republicans' refusal to help them. The Democrats, for their part, continued to have lower class populist appeal, and both parties were largely in favor of big business, with the Republicans being a bit more keen on big government development of the West. The ensuing social changes spurred one of the biggest waves of American art, not only directly, like in the case of, say, Mark Twain, but also created an environment for subsequent generations to romanticize, like the Western genre. America's golden age of literature through the 1920s and 30s would be the result of the Gilded Age's industrialized society, which persisted through the Great Depression and even into the modern day. Political radicalism starts to emerge here as well, with anarchy and populist socialist ideas emerging in the face of emerging plutocracy in mainstream politics. In fact, there is even a third party, the Populist Party, which plays a role in one of these coming elections. Because this era is so heavily defined by social and economic factors, the political side of things is often looked over, hence the precedence of this period not being as famous as its artists or billionaires. While the Gilded Age starts under Grant, the first president that we're looking at is his Republican successor, Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes is somewhat infamous for his ascendancy with the Compromise of 1877. Basically, some contested electoral votes in the 76 election were given to Hayes, despite his opponent winning the popular vote, deeply upsetting the South and causing threats of another civil war. In exchange, 
Republicans ended Reconstruction, pulling federal government troops out of the South and paving the way for Jim Crow laws over the coming decades to repress black people. This of course made Hayes extremely divisive, essentially losing Republicans the significant black vote and throwing the legitimacy of the electoral process into question. To try and quell the division, Hayes only ran for one term. He tried to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that Grant had started, but this was struck down by the Supreme Court. Like Grant before him, Hayes continued to break treaties with Native Americans, especially against the Sioux. Showing the control that big business had over the government at the time, Hayes sent federal troops to break up the Great Railway Strike of 1877. However, the economy also began to improve and recover from the previous panic of 1867. The following election in 1880 brought Republican James Garfield to power, but he was actually assassinated nine months after taking office in 1881, hence the bump he's one of the four presidents who have been assassinated. His VP, Chester A. Arthur, replaced him. Arguably Arthur's most important contribution to U.S. history was the 1883 Pendleton Act, which got rid of the spoils system started by Andrew Jackson and the Democrats. Basically, the spoils system was where if a president won, his supporters and donors got positions in the government and all the predecessors got fired. Part of the reason Garfield was assassinated was because his assassin believed that he was owed a position as a result of that system since he had stumped for Garfield, and this act of violence pushed most people over the edge. Now, people are chosen for government jobs based on merit, and firing based on political orientation is illegal. While he was seen as unifying, Arthur had a darker side as well. He continued to break treaties with the Sioux and signed the Chinese Exclusion Act, making it impossible for Chinese migrants to come to the U.S. on the basis of race. Despite being a Republican, Arthur never made any attempts to protect black people from democratic policies in the South, something that Republicans would at least try to do before and after him. Arthur also didn't run again, a tradition for vice presidents that would be broken by Teddy Roosevelt, and he was replaced with Democrat Grover Cleveland, who lost his second bid in 1888 to Republican Benjamin Harrison. Harrison was the president to effectively end the Indian Wars, with the last non-reservation Indian land being taken by the U.S. in 1889. The following year, the Wounded Knee Massacre took place, killing 90 Lakota people, as well as 31 U.S. soldiers who killed each other in crossfire. For these deeds, Harrison granted 13 men medals of honor. Harrison added the most states of any president, admitting Idaho, Montana, North and South Dakota, Washington, and Wyoming as states. Keeping with this theme of territorial expansion and consolidation, he also increased the size of the U.S. Navy and had the Queen of Hawaii overthrown. On a more peaceful note, Harrison also pushed the Pan American Congress in 1889, sort of like a Western Hemisphere UN. Further, Harrison also passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, the first major step in combating the plutocratic elements in America at the time. After Harrison, Cleveland came back largely with the Populist Party's help since they split the Republican vote, and he was followed by Republican McKinley, and around here we get the Roosevelt and World War I bump in popularity again. And from here, we get the last drop in popularity, although it's really just one main guy we're going to be looking at today, Warren G. Harding. Harding stands alone as the least well-known president of the 20th century by a good margin, and is significantly less popular than those who came before and after him. After World War I, Harding took office in 1921, campaigning on a return to normalcy. World War I had changed the U.S. in many ways. It was the country's first time getting involved in a European war, and the carnage was the worst war since the Civil War. At the same time, the Spanish flu, which actually started in Kansas, had wreaked havoc on the nation, and the entry into the war had spread it into Europe. Wilson had attempted to keep America in the international order with the League of Nations, but after the negative experiences abroad, America turned inward. At home, immigration dropped dramatically to only a couple million in the decade, mostly from Germany, Italy, and Mexico. The 20s saw a rapid revival of the economy, and the Roaring Twenties was in. 
despite alcohol being banned constitutionally under Wilson, the liquid courage still flowed, fueling a rise in consumer culture, music, physical liberation, and crime. Harding, by dint of being the return to normalcy, was responsible for much of the policy that helped pave the way for this, although again, the culture and economy overshadowed the politics. In fact, Harding's successor, Calvin Coolidge, is often considered to be one of the quietest presidents. Quickly after entering office, Harding slashed taxes and wartime economic controls, a move that helped the economy recover, but arguably also paved the way for the Great Depression years later. Aside from the economy, Harding passed the Shepherd Towner Act, which funded maternal care centers across the United States, helping to decrease infant mortality, although the bill ended just in time for the Great Depression. A more significant piece of legislation he signed, however, was the Emergency Quota Act of 1921 in a bid to prevent mass immigration from war-torn Europe. Further, the act restricted immigration based on the existing immigrant communities in the U.S., according to earlier census numbers, meaning that groups that already existed in the U.S. in larger numbers, mainly Irish and German, had an easier time getting in than in later waves like Poles and Italians to say nothing of non-European immigrants. The idea of quotas and economic need from the bill has actually somewhat remained in place and informs modern immigration policy to this day. Despite being banned, Harding had parties with alcohol in the White House, but the corruption was much deeper than that. Harding's cabinet was extremely corrupt, often taking bribes from big companies. In the Teapot Dome scandal, revolving around his Secretary of the Interior leasing oil on the cheap to friendly companies, the first cabinet member in U.S. history went to jail. While it's debated to what degree Harding was aware of this, the corruption still affected his presidency, and he is generally seen as the most corrupt president in U.S. history, and one of the nation's worst. However, Harding wouldn't have to see the end of his term, as he died of a heart attack in 1923, with Calvin Coolidge replacing him. So, these are the least well-known presidents in U.S. history, in my opinion. Let me know in the comments what you think. Do you think I left some presidents out, or did I leave any significant events from their presidencies out? in terms of which of these presidents should probably be a bit more well known. I honestly feel like Harrison and Harding are the best candidates here, maybe Fillmore, just because they actually did a few things that were somewhat important, even if they weren't good necessarily. I think Van Buren is probably the most forgettable of all of these presidents, which sort of surprised me honestly. If we look at the commonalities between these presidents and their eras and see what made them so forgettable, we can see a few things. One is that they were all one-term presidents. A second thing is that they were often president in a time period where the government was not very important or not very effective. In the growing pains period, the government was very important, but it really wasn't doing anything substantial, especially on the issue of slavery and westward expansion. So while they should have had a bigger role, everyone kept kicking the can down the road and no one really had to deal with it until Abraham Lincoln, hence why he is so famous. When it comes to the Gilded Age, we see again that the economy and the social factors coming out of these massive societal changes were more important in the world than the politics that helped shape it. The 1920s as well was much more popular in terms of society and economy than politics, at least in the United States. So that's it for this video, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think if you want to see another president's video. Uh, hopefully this video doesn't get totally messed up by me saying slavery over and over again. And I will see you in the next one. Again, remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that fun stuff. Uh, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.